Thank you, Vivek, and uh, thank you, Sandeep. So actually, I know I was coming here two days ago. I was giving a talk at uh, the 50th anniversary of the CSA founding, and Sandeep found out I was talking about bandits. So he said, come over here. So here I am. OK, so multi-arm bandits revisited. And actually, you know, I, Sandeep was just asking me, how long have you been working on bandits? And there's two answers. Either I can say 40 years or three, four months. So three, four months is my, you know, all, my, all the students nowadays want to work on machine learning. So Shilu came to me and said, machine learning. So one of the problems we decided to look at was bandits. And uh, this other uh, Ping Chung Sheb uh, was my postdoc. And he's now a faculty member at uh, a National Chow Tong University in uh, uh, Taiwan, which he just joined. OK, and then Anirban Bhattacharya is a, a statistician uh, at uh, our university. OK, so I'm, uh, this talk is a little bit of a historical thing, no proofs, OK? But I'll give you a history of the field of bandits, and I'll end with what we're doing. So all of you, for those of you who have not been in a casino, that's a slot machine. It's also called a one-armed bandit, because very colorfully, as Lion Robbins put it, in the long run, they're pretty effective, OK? And uh, the two-armed bandit problem, the classic one, is there are two bandits. Uh, theta one, think of it as a Bernoulli bandit. Theta one is a probability that this will give you uh, one rupee, theta two is a probability. This will give you one rupee. And every day, you have to play one of them forever. That's your punishment. And if you play an arm I on the teeth trial, then you will get a reward R of T, which is, e, which is one with probability theta I or zero with probability one minus theta I. And clearly, you want to play the arm with the larger theta, but the problem is you don't know theta one, theta two. So what should we do? That's the classic problem. And of course, the idea is maybe we should play each arm a few times. That's called exploration. And then you choose whichever is better and play it. That's called exploitation. And in fact, there's the fundamental trade-off between exploration and exploitation in a lot of uh, machine learning. Okay. So the quintessential dilemma is exploration or exploitation. And uh, exploration can be valuable, but it's costly. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. So all the games will be paired yeah, the both the both of the arms are uh, yeah. So so each. Uh, this is not a Bayesian setup. Sorry. This is not a Bayesian setup. Bayes? It's not Bayes. It's there are two arms, each with this probability unknown parameter in the interval zero to one for each. Okay. It's just uh, one sequence. On each day, you can pick this arm. All Bernoulli trials. All Bernoulli. Bernoulli. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so what's the best trade-off between exploration and exploitation? And uh, the canonical uh, uh, do-good example is uh, uh, experimental drugs. And you don't know the efficacy, and you want to try it. And which drug to give? And actually, the person who, who actually started this whole field, Thompson, in 1933, said, you know, if you could solve this, uh, there will be a savings of individuals uh, sacrificed. Okay. All right. Now let's move to the modern era. In the modern era, if you uh, do a Google search, and uh, I did a search for hotels, and uh, at the top of the page, these are the paid advertisements. At the bottom of the page are the ones that go do page rank and all that stuff. So, uh, so the way Google makes money is when you click on a paid ad, only when you click, they get money. And how much money you get, that's dependent on their bid. So this one may have bid $5, this may have bid $50, this may have bid $10. Uh, now, just because you bid more money doesn't mean Google will put it up there because nobody may click on you. They don't know your popularity. So you don't know, they don't know the probability that you'll click on that or this. So they have to explore and exploit. And in fact, 90% uh, or so of uh, Google's revenue comes from playing bandits all the time. And I did a calculation. I forgot. It's either $40,000 a second or $40,000 a minute. That's the amount of gambling, gambling going on. Okay? So it's a lot of money. And the question is, what are they popular? And, and in this case, actually, fine-tuning this optimality is actually financially very profitable. And there's a lot, lot of other applications. So more generally, let me give you a historical account of uh, banditry. So what's been happening? So the first person who uh, looked at this was, uh, suggested this problem was Thompson, who was actually a very good uh, statistician, mathematician, et cetera, and uh, in the Department of Pathology at Yale. And uh, he was interested in the general interest in, uh, in research planning 
And how can you use data, however meager it may be, to guide action? And you need to take action before you get more data, okay? And uh, he's directly concerned with any case where you can decide uh, which mode of operation is better. And he said you can save people's lives. Okay, so that was Thompson. And uh, Thompson came up with a suggestion for this problem, which turns out to be pretty good. Okay, even now it's one of the best. So what he, uh, for, for each arm, he took, let's say, let's say you take a, a beta distribution, okay, for the uh, thing. And then after a few trials, you can get a revised beta distribution for each arm, okay. And then he looked at the probability that uh, one arm is better, okay. So he's looking at the probability that a beta here is better than a beta there. And let P be the probability that, say, the red arm is better. And then he says, let me play arm, the red arm or arm one with a probability which is a function of P, okay? And the question is how to choose this function. So his calculation was as follows. He said, if I uh, play arm one, okay, how much would I lose? Well, with probability one minus P, arm two is better. And then, but I play arm one, so this is the loss. On the other hand, if I play arm one with probability, if I play arm two, this is the probability that arm one is better and you're playing arm uh, one. Therefore, he said, let's equalize these things by symmetry, choose fp equal to p. That was his reasoning. And that is called Thompson sampling now. Play an arm with the probability that it is better, okay? And still one of the best policies as we will see. Okay, in fact, it's pretty tough to beat it, okay? Uh, Thompson actually very interesting, okay? So this may be historically interesting. He said, what's a, uh, supposing I want to calculate the probability that uh, one beta is better than another beta, okay? So beta with S1 successes and F1 failures, what's the probability that it's better than uh, S2 successes, F2 failures? It's hard to compute, but he did a lot of calculations and he said that's actually the probability that if you have N1 plus one red balls, N1 is the total number of trials, and N2 blue balls, and if you were to randomly place them in order, this is the probability that you, if you proceed from the left, you'll find S1 red balls before S2 blue balls. And he actually built a cardboard triangular box which he describes how he built it, and uh, uh, but this was published in the Journal of Mathematics, and he was very happy. He said, I shook it up, and every time you do more trials, you add a ball, et cetera. And he's very happy, the rapidity with which the machine brought about a reversal of favor to the better Monte method. Carlo. Before computers, Monte Carlo. <laughs> this is Monte Carlo, okay? Yeah. So, yeah. Actually, it's not Monte Carlo. It's the exact solution, exact solution, okay? Of his, uh, implementation of his solution. Okay, so let me, uh, so, uh, you know, now, you know, in the history of ideas, everything is, Everything that you know now looks obvious, right? But this notion of adaptive sampling also was not quite uh, obvious. So traditional sampling uh, is based on fixed size. And in fact, uh, Robbins complains that the reason why traditional things was based on fixed size is because a statistician was only consulted after the experiment was done. So they do something, get the data, and then say, statistician, tell us something, okay? And the first person actually who thought about uh, 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 adaptive sampling was actually uh, Mahalanobis, okay, and he was interested in uh, estimating the jute acreage in uh, Bengal, okay, and even though there was no theory, a uh, very pioneering paper in that area. Uh, probably one of the earliest beginnings was this work by Dodge and Tomek, 1941, and they were concerned with the following problem. Supposing I have a factory producing goods, and I want to determine whether these goods are defective, okay? Are they acceptable or defective? So he said, let me take N1 samples. If less than D1 are defective, then it's okay. You pass it. On the other hand, if more than D2 are defect, then you reject it. But if it's between D1 and D2, then you take more samples. So that's adaptive, okay? So that is the solution that he proposed. It's called the two sample method. And of course, that whole area was cleaned up by Wald, Abraham Wald in 1950 with the sequential design of experiments and so on. Who Suggested stopping at any time, etc. Okay, so uh, there's a frequentist and a Bayesian viewpoint. So this Bayesian viewpoint was uh, studied by Robbins in 1952, and is completely unaware of Thompson's work. Didn't know. Why did he continue I'm sorry. Just Why did he continue shows it. I mean, shouldn't ask a Bayesian that. 
Question. I know. So they, he just chose a prior. Beta. That was uh, Thompson. Yeah. He just chose, he, uh, so S1, F1, S2, F2, start with some initial values and keep updating. That's it. So frequentist uh, thing. So Robbins was unaware of uh, Thompson's work. He said, let theta 1, theta 2 be arbitrary. And he said, my goal is the usual one. I want to keep playing such that the long-term average reward I get is the maximum of theta 1, theta 2, OK? And uh, he, I mean, also, he said, this is, represents this general question of how we should learn from experience. And uh, later on, in a Bayesian setting, uh, Sam Carlin and Johnson studied this. And uh, they were trying to prove that certainty equivalence is not optimal. That is, choosing the empirically better one is not optimal. And uh, that's what they looked at. And then, of course, that whole area was then cleaned up by Bellman with uh, dynamic programming. So Bellman also was interested in the general field of learning processes, where we must determine the structure of a process while carrying on an experiment. And uh, this is his uh, discounted dynamic programming equation. Suppose you have two arms described by these two parameters. Then if you play arm one with this probability, it's a success. If it's a success, you up the number of successes and you collect your one rupee. If it's a failure, you don't collect your one rupee, you upset the fa these are failures, and you get this uh, functional equation which you need to solve. And he was surprised that it was so difficult to prove even simple things like stay on a winner, okay, and so on. Okay, but it, this problem was uh, actually solved uh, very elegantly by uh, Gittins and Jones in uh, 1972 and for the discounted case, and they came up with this index. So consider stopping times. So maximize overall stopping times the, for an arm, the expected uh, discounted reward up to the stopping time divided by the discount, expected discounted time. That's the index of an arm, okay? And then they showed that if you play the arm with the largest index, that's optimal. So that completely solves the uh, problem. Okay, but let's go a little bit beyond uh, bandits and we'll come back to bandits. So more generally, uh, in, in the field of control, people have been looking at uh, uh, how to control systems. And uh, so take a very simple linear system. There's a, I don't know, some Gaussian, right? Some IID noise, or Gaussian noise, say, and then this is the state, it gets updated, and ut is some control action. And let us say you want to minimize some quadratic of the states and the actions. Uh, but supposing I don't know this control gain b. I don't know it. Then if I choose a humongous u, I can get a huge uh, swamp or the signal to noise ratio and get an estimate of b. Okay? But on the other hand, choosing a large u is expensive. So there's this traditional, this trade-off between exploration and exploitation. And uh, investigate or act. And uh, Feldbaum in the Soviet Union uh, called this the dual control problem. Control has two purposes in a, in a system. And more generally, uh, you know, this, if you go to POM DPs, these are generalizations of these problems and generally difficult to solve. Uh, adaptive control. So, from the 1950s onwards, the holy grail of control theory was uh, the following. There's a black box. This is a genuinely black box. You don't know the dynamic equations of that black box. It's some kind of a stochastic dynamical system. Let's say linear stochastic system. And uh, you want to build a controller, an adaptive controller that will control this black box, whatever it is, and give you satisfactory performance. So you want to learn the system as you control and use this knowledge in real time to control the system. So again, exploration, exploitation. Uh, and the questions, but in this case, depending on the field, the emphasis slightly changes. In the banded problems, there's no issue of stability of the system, the state going off to infinity. But if this is a linear system, it could go to infinity, and once you throw in your adaptive controller with least squares estimates and so on and so forth, this becomes a nonlinear controller of a linear system. So this overall thing becomes a nonlinear stochastic dynamical system. And fundamental questions are, uh, is it stable? Uh, does it generate enough excitation on its own to learn all the modes of the system? And you can think of uh, uh, all the issues related to linear systems. 
So uh, a lot of uh, engineering success came from this uh, self-tuning regulator work of Astrom and Wittenmark in 1973. And basically they were looking at these uh, RMAX uh, systems. So you have some linear combination of uh, outputs uh, equal to some linear combination of inputs plus some noises. So this is kind of uh, modeling a color system, linear system, it's a colored noise. Okay? And uh, the traditional goal in this area was to minimize the output variance. Why is that? Because the uh, interest, oops, I did something. Because uh, it turns out that the major application of this was process control in the chemical industry. And uh, the more finely you control the process variation, the better the performance. And in fact, a big motivation example was uh, paper making. So there's a paper machine, and if you can control the thickness very well, then you can set it set point slightly lower to guarantee a minimum thickness, and you can actually get a save uh, whatever, you know, make a huge savings in cost and things like that. Okay, so in this particular case, there are some interesting issues related to uh, the design of the minimum variance controller, but, uh, but uh, what uh, Astrom and uh, Wittenmark actually implemented this thing, and it was implemented in many, many industries, but there were a lot of theoretical questions. Is it stable? Does it self-optimize? Do the, param the parameters uh, uh, converge to the right thing? Is it self-tuning and so on? So the scheme here is very simple. You can estimate uh, these coefficients by stochastic approximation or least squares, and you can choose a linear controller which would be optimal if the parameters were correct. So this is certainty equivalence. Okay, make an estimate. Assume they're correct. Do what the estimates give you. And uh, there was, a, for many decades, this was an open problem. Is it stable and so on? So stability was finally resolved in uh, 1981. And then uh, we established a convergence of these parameters for the stochastic approximation case. And uh, for the least squares case, uh, Go and Chen established it. And there's very... No exploration. No exploration. So we wanted to do this with zero exploration. Just automatically will it generate enough excitation to do it so that... And uh, the question was, what, ha what happens in the least squares case is that uh, as you implement a system, I'll tell you, you lose identifiability. So it turns out the regression matrix least squares, they, they start becoming dependent. And so you, the condition number goes to infinity. So the, what is the rate at which that happens? And very delicate question. So finally resolved, okay, after many decades. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So the control you choose at time t depends on the past outputs and past, past inputs because the state of this Rmax process is actually a vector of past outputs. So it's, yeah. Uh, so why is not the state? It's a, it's a string of y's which is the state. Correct, correct, exactly. Uh, I may have uh, goofed up. This could be ut minus one, you're right. This is, Sorry, typo, yeah, UT minus one. Okay, but why does this work, okay? And I'm jumping a little bit ahead. Why is there no identifiability problem in minimum variance control? Because of a very happy coincidence, okay? And that's the reason why this whole uh, thing worked. Let us take a very simple system, okay? Uh, XT plus one is AXT plus BU plus, and this is a white Gaussian noise. Uh, the minimum variance controller basically tries to knock this term off so that x becomes w. So the minimum variance controller is minus a over b x t. Now what happens is that it ends up in making the, this equal to w, which is a minimum variance. Now, if you're doing a certainty equivalence uh, control, you will estimate these parameters alpha, beta by least squares, by doing a least squares fit. And then you will choose a control which is uh, minus alpha or beta, where these are your estimates. Now, what happens is that if you can identify the closed loop gain, okay, uh, so, so you, when you, according to your estimates, you choose this gain. So according to you, the closed loop gain is zero, which means that these uh, x's will be independent. And you can, so you actually converge to estimates with that property. And that happens only when a minus b alpha or beta is also zero, which means that alpha or beta is also optimal for the original system. So even though there's an identifiability problem, it still works out, okay? And so closed loop identifiability is enough for optimality and there's no identifiability problem. 
Okay, so now let me move to the stuff which, uh, which will bring us back to bandits. So consider the adaptive control problem for Markov decision processes. So what's the Markov decision process? There's a bunch of uh, states, uh, i, j, k, etc. And you take, if you take an action u, then you go to i from i to j with a transition probability. Uh, and you get a certain reward, okay? Now, this transition, the system is unknown, so these transition probabilities, let us say, depend on an unknown parameter, theta, okay? So that's the problem. So we have a state space x, we have a control set u, we have a parameter set theta, and the dynamics are given by uh, these transition probabilities, and there's a reward, and there's an unknown parameter, theta zero, okay? And the goal, let us say, is to maximize this long-term average reward, okay? So that's what you want to maximize. Okay, so little, uh, uh, I, this is the only place where I have to define some terms. Let us say that for each parameter theta, you solve this uh, optimization problem and you come up with a control law. So when the state is i, you take an action ui, which is optimal for that parameter theta and let this be the mapping. Okay, so phi i theta is the optimal action to take when you're in state i and the parameter is actually theta. Okay, that's the one thing you have to remember. And this problem was examined by Peter Mandel in uh, the Charles University in uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, he studied the certainty equivalence approach and he said, okay, let's estimate the unknown parameter with a, uh, say, maximum likelihood estimate. So basically, this is the likelihood. If you have a sequence x0 through xt, and you've taken a sequence of actions, then the, because it's Markovian, the product of these transition probabilities is a likelihood, and you maximize that over theta, that gives you an estimate theta hat of t. Okay? And then you pretend that that is correct, theta hat of t, and, and you look at your current state and you take the action. So this is certainty equivalence. So Mandel studied this problem, and he said, examine the question, does self-tuning occur? Will these parameter estimates converge to the true ones? And if so, then under some continuity assumptions or in the discrete case, it's not a big, big deal, uh, the, you also get the uh, optimality of the reward. But in order to do that, he found he needed to impose an identifiability condition. And this identifiability condition basically says that uh, in every state and for every action, whenever there are two different parameters, the outgoing transition probability vectors are different. So that means whenever you take any action in any state, you learn something to separate any two parameters, okay? Very strong identifiability condition, okay? So there could never be two actions, there could be, never be an action which under two different parameters, for a particular state, the vector is the same, okay? Very strong identifiability condition. Now this problem was examined by Vivek Borkar in his PhD thesis, part of his PhD thesis in uh, 1979, said what if identifiability condition is not satisfied? So then what Vivek showed is that uh, these parameter estimates will converge to some parameters. I'm simplifying all the technicalities here. Uh, they will converge to something, okay, a random variable. And when that happens, your control law will also converge, okay? And here's what happens, okay? So asymptotically, as your, as your parameter estimates converge and your control law converges, the system is evolving like this. There's a true parameter theta zero, which is governing the dynamics, but the feedback is this control law. So the system is the true parameter closed with a control law that's optimal for your estimated parameter, okay? And you will then equilibrate to that parameter estimates only if that parameter theta zero can, theta star can explain these closed loop dynamics. So you'll converge to a theta star such that under theta star, when you, uh, sorry, such that the control, optimal control law under theta star, uh, you cannot separate these two systems. So in closed loop, they will be the same, okay? So that's what we make sure. So, uh, so you'll converge to a theta star such that when you take these uh, actions, the theta star and theta zero look the same. So what's happening here is that as theta converges, we stop exploring for better control laws, right? So as you start exploiting, the exploration ceases, okay? And therefore this limit, 
they, these two things need not be equal. The control loss may not be equal. So this is not optimal. It doesn't self-optimize. Okay? All right. So then we looked at this problem after Vivek and uh, discovered that there is an interesting property here that you can hopefully exploit, which I'm going to call the bias of the maximum likelihood estimate. So what is the bias? Okay. So one more notation I need. <laughs> uh, if you implement a control law phi, when the parameter is theta, let V phi theta be the long-term average reward. So this is a reward you get averaged over a long time when you're implementing this control law and the parameter is theta. And let V theta be the optimal reward. So I should uh, say here, let us suppose phi theta is now the optimal control law for theta applied to theta, that's the optimal reward. Okay, so I need these two notations, and if you're comfortable with that, then the rest of it will be easy. Now, due to the closed loop identification, what you get is that the transition probabilities when you implement the control law of phi theta star will be the same under theta zero or theta star. That's what Vivek proved. And then what that implies is that the reward, the long-term average reward you incur under phi theta star will be the same whether the parameter is theta star or theta zero. Because these transition probabilities are the same and the rewards are the same. The re I'm sorry, the one-step rewards are the same. The long-term average rewards are the same. Now that has an interesting implication. This means that the optimal reward under theta star, which is equal to the reward under theta star when you apply the optimal control law for theta star, is the same as the reward under phi theta star when the true parameter is theta zero. But this reward is not the optimal reward that you could get for theta zero because as far as theta zero is concerned, this is just an arbitrary control law. So this is less than the optimal reward. So, in, so what this means is that the parameter estimates converge to a theta star whose optimal reward is smaller than V theta zero. So they converge to something with smaller rewards. Okay, and so the question is, can we somehow bias maximum likelihood and push it towards rewards which are larger? Okay, so can we bias maximum likelihood and favor parameters whose optimal reward is larger? Okay, so that's what we looked at, and this was actually my first uh, PhD uh, uh, student. And uh, so we bias maximum likelihood estimates slightly towards parameter with larger rewards, and how do we do that? So this is your uh, likelihood function. I'm going to add a multiplicative term here, which favors larger rewards, okay? And I'm going to actually exponentiate it with some sequence uh, alpha of t, and then I'll maximize this, okay? So this is the biased, or the cost or reward biased maximum likelihood estimate. Now, why does it work, okay? Now I'm going to choose this alpha of t delicately. It's going to be small, it'll be little o of t, but it'll be large, in the sense that it goes to infinity, okay? So it'll diverge, but be little of t. That's the delicate part. Now, the fact that it is small and the fact that it is large are both important. It is small because, you know, I don't want it to damage the maximum likelihood, the good properties of the maximum likelihood estimates. If I mess with the maximum likelihood method, I'll get terrible estimates. So I don't want to damage that. And this little of t is enough. It won't damage it for the following reason. If you take the logarithm of this, Okay, then you get alpha t log v theta and the product becomes a sum. Now this term, because of alpha t, will grow like little of t. Whereas this being a sum will grow like t. So this bias term is small compared to this. Okay, so in that sense, it doesn't damage closed loop identification. These are all, uh, there's a lot of theorems to prove, okay, but this is the idea, all right. Now why, at the same time, why is it large enough to do the trick? The reason it's large enough to do the trick is, let's look at the log, let's look at the likelihood ratio. So here I'm taking the likelihoods, but normalizing it by the true parameters and the true theta. And that normalization is just equivalent to dividing the likelihood function by a constant, so it doesn't change the maximum likelihood estimates. So you get this expression and the maximum likelihood estimate maximizes this uh, cost or reward bias likelihood ratio. Now, this term 
If v theta is smaller than v theta 0 and alpha t is going to infinity, this term goes to 0. On the other hand, and this is um, there's much more difficulty here, but think of it the following way. This likelihood ratio is a martingale. It's a positive martingale and therefore bounded for each parameter. Okay. Uh, therefore, uh, if v theta is less than v theta 0, the sum will go to 0 and this will drive it to 0 and therefore it won't be a maximizer of the likelihood. However, this is much more difficult to prove because I'm not dealing with the likelihood ratio, I'm dealing with the maximum likelihood. So I'm taking the maximum of several positive martingales and that turns out to be very complicated. So a lot of work to analyze that, but this is the rough idea, okay? So you can actually show at the end of the day that these parameter estimates converge to some theta star where this optimal reward now is larger than theta zero. So now you get the reverse inequality. And now if you put these two things together, you get a beautiful result. Now the optimal reward under theta star as before uh, was uh, larger than v theta zero, but v theta zero, I'm sorry, was smaller than v theta zero, but v theta zero is smaller than v theta star. So you get equality throughout, which means that the control law of phi theta star that you converge to is actually optimal for theta zero. This becomes equality. So you get self-optimality, okay? That's what happens. So phi theta star is optimal for theta zero, hence the optimal average reward. Alpha t is just a little of t, but going to infinity. That's it. Uh, there's more complications. When we proved it for the Markov chain case, I needed a minimum uh, growth rate, okay, for alpha. Okay, let's go back to, okay, so actually in 1982, when I did the, when we did this bandit thing, I actually, in those days we used to have technical reports, you know, so I actually calculated out what this would be for a bandit. I cannot find that manuscript, you know, published. So uh, calculated, so basically this cost bias maximum likelihood estimate says that you should optimize the following problem. This is the likelihood function when you have S1 successes, F1 failures, right? This is a likelihood function. But the cost biasing says if there are M arms, choose the, let's suppose there are two arms, okay? Choose the larger and raise that to a power alpha. This is the criterion you need to maximize. And then you have to worry about commutation of theta and I and so on. At the end of the day, you get a very explicit index. So just like Gittins and Jones, we get an index for the arm, which is a very simple formula. If an arm has S successes and F failures, define this index, okay, which has, which involves this term alpha. Okay. And the cost bias method suggests play the arm with a larger index, and that involves the optimal reward. Okay, so uh, now at that time, there was the word regret had not been used in a mathematical sense. Okay, this was to come later, but let me now put it in the in the current term. So in the current uh, terminology, you define something called the regret at time t. The regret at time t is the total reward you have obtained compared to the maximum reward that you could have obtained if you knew the true parameter, true parameter. I should put in here an expectation, okay? So this is the expected regret. So expected regret says, how far were you from playing the optimal reward over t days? And the fact that I'm uh, uh, getting long-term average optimality means that this expected regret is little of capital T. So if you divide by capital T, this long-term average converges to the maximum. So that's what we proved. Uh, now that idea, I mean, so that's all we were concerned with. Uh, now, uh, we extended that to many other systems, including my interest in control theory, linear quadratic systems, uh, et cetera, where many other issues come up with resulting in uh, from stability and things like that. And we embarked on that and did a lot of work there. Uh, that, uh, that line of work found some resonance in learning theory and it has been, you know, followed up on that. But not the bandit stuff and that's what I want to get to. So let's get back to bandits, okay? So in 1985, yeah. No, so, so I'm, I haven't gotten to that. I'm going to talk of log t in a second. So all we showed and all in those days that we were concerned with was little of t. Never thought it would be interesting to put an expected value here and look at this, okay? The reason I didn't do that was because I said if you're looking at it, I was only thinking sample pathways. You know, control system, I'm interested in sample paths. So I said in a sample path, I can get as little, I can make this as good as 
because I can choose rarefied sampling. I can sample over very rare sequences, but as long as I do anything infinitely often, you know, I'll get convergence. And so I can make this, if you look at it in the sample patterns, I can make it as small as you want. You know? So I was not concerned about the putting expectation there. And I'll get to that in a second. So, so then comes, uh, then comes, okay, so, so now let's back to bandits. And, and then in 1985, about three years later, a lion Robbins, in a beautiful paper, they said, hey, listen, let's look at the regret, okay? We were only looking at regret divided by T. They said, let's look at, let's put the T up there, look at the regret, the expected regret. And they said, uh, long, so long-term average means this regret is little of T, but they said, how small can you make regret? Getting to your question. And beautiful work, they showed that uh, uh, the best you can make it is uh, C log T, and they came up with a policy for that. And the policy, which every person in machine learning knows, is called the upper confidence bound policy, which is very simple. You, de you, de de you determine a confidence interval for each arm, okay, from zero to that. And this is called upper confidence bound. And they said, play the arm with the highest upper confidence bound. So don't go by the mean estimates. Look at the uncertainty. Look at the uncertainty interval. Take the largest uh, the uh, upper bound of that and play according to that, okay? So that's the upper confidence bound policy. The idea is the following. Supposing there's an arm you have not explored enough, you haven't played much with it, then its uncertainty is huge, so its upper bound is huge, so you're likely to play it. So it encourages exploration. On the other hand, if you played it a lot, then the confidence interval becomes small and you're going roughly by the mean, it automatically calibrates itself. And they showed that that achieves optimal regret. Okay, now let's go back to the, let's come back to today. What are currently empirically the best policies for minimizing regret? And the machine learning people have studied this to death. They've simulated the hell out of it, okay? So uh, among the best are still Thompson sampling, still the best. Play the arm with the probability that it is the best, where the probability you can just choose some beta or something. Okay? And UCB, upper confidence bound, which basically takes the mean plus uh, uh, the uncertainty around that, the, upper, the confidence interval is uh, root log t over nt, nt is the number of times you've played it, okay? And then very recently, there is this uh, uh, Rousseau and Ben Van Roy, Stanford. Uh, so they said, hey, listen, we want to do exploration, we want to do exploitation, why don't we combine it? And they kind of arbitrarily came up with uh, the following. Okay, they said, Exploration means I want to get information about what's the best choice. That means I want to reduce the entropy with respect to what's the optimal arm, okay? So exp exploring means entropy reduction. On the other hand, exploitation means reducing the regret, which is this. So they said, let's combine it. Let's take what you want to minimize, put in the numerator. What you want to ma maximize, put in the denominator. Take this ratio and minimize it. They call this information-directed search. And uh, this has very good uh, uh, regret performance, but it's very difficult because you have to do a lot of computation of high-dimensional integrals to max to do all these comp computations of entropy and all that stuff, okay? And they do say that there is much more work to be done to design efficient algorithms for various problem classes. So that's the state of affairs today. Okay, now I should mention, and this is something I, I'm trying to puzzle over, but I can't figure it out, so maybe I'll just throw it up there. It turns out that this cost bias maximum likelihood estimate for Bernoulli arms can also be written, uh, the index can also be written as a difference in entropies, okay? Uh, if you have S successes, total number of trials N, it's the difference between these two entropies. Now, interestingly, these entropies both involve the number of successes, which is like a, a mean value and the number of trials, which is exploration. So it does consider those two things, but I can't figure it out. I don't know, I don't understand it, okay? But it, interestingly enough, it has that uh, formulation. Okay, so coming back now, so let's go back. Uh, so both these, uh, so right now this, this is a very well-known phrase in uh, machine learning called optimization in the face of uncertainty, which is actually a good philosophy in life, right? If you're not sure, be optimistic, okay? And the, the UCB and the cost bias maximum likelihood estimate do it in two different ways. 
So what we did was we deliberately biased the maximum likelihood estimate towards arms with larger theta, deliberately biased. Whereas what UCB does is it prefers arms for which there's a larger theta. Okay, it's a different way. Now, there's been lots, thorough testing of UCB and Thompson sampling over the years because there's a lot of money riding on this, billions of dollars, okay? Uh, but absolutely no follow-up work on cost pass max and likelihood estimate. In fact, machine learning ground doesn't know about it. And in fact, I also didn't look at this problem for 40 years, okay? So, then along come my students, Shi Lu, and said, I want to do machine learning. So, we said, let's do this thing because bandits is very hot. Okay, so machine learning community generally apparently unaware of this. So, that brings me to the new results here. Question, what is the regret guarantee that you can provide? We didn't study regrets. So I said, let's do it. How easy is it to implement? How does its regret perform empirically? And the name of the game in machine learning is empirical. Test it and show me the actual work because all these things are bounds, you know. They want actual ground performance. And what's the current best policy? What do we know? What is the best at the moment, okay? All right. So let me look at, uh, generalize a little bit beyond Bernoulli bandits and talk of the exponential family distributions. So exponential family distributions where I'm going to choose this, the mean parameter x. So consider parameters of this form, okay, distributions of this form. Uh, then uh, if it's a minimal representation, then this is a, a theta is a strictly convex function. And the mean of this distribution is the derivative of a and that is strictly increasing, okay. This is the exponential family. And that includes, by the way, exponential distributions, uh, uh, Gaussian distributions, and many, many other common distributions. So for this whole exponential family bandits, the cost pass maximum likelihood estimate goes as follows. Uh, this is the likelihood function. And we're only taking this part of the likelihood function because we don't need to take h of x because it doesn't depend on theta. So if something doesn't depend on theta, there's no point worrying about it. So just take that. And then you take the the mean reward, which is a prime theta, raise it to a power alpha, but it turns out that you can throw in your favorite monotone function here, strictly monotone function, it doesn't matter because all I'm concerned is about all the relationships when I prove equality here. So this is the general cost bias maximum likelihood estimate formula and it has an explicit uh, solution. There are also a lot of interesting tricks that you can play here. So because a prime theta is strictly increasing, for example, you could take m to be the inverse of that and then you could just make it linear in theta. Or you could do other things. You could make it logarithmic or something and then play games and it gives you different indices, okay, interestingly. And they all do well, okay, we'll see. So this is, this is the explicit index. You maximize this minus maximize this. Explicit index for the whole exponential family, okay. All right. And then the solution is play the arm with the largest index. But it's not the Bayesian version of Gittins and Jones. This is uh, for the frequentist uh, viewpoint. Okay, and in fact, you can cal calculate the indices for common distributions. For Bernoulli, I already showed you this formula. Uh, for exponential band, it's very simple formula. It's the total reward you get divided by alpha of t, which is your bias rate. For Gaussian band, it's even simpler. It's the total, it's the average reward you get plus alpha t over t. This is interestingly different from uh, Lie-Robbins because Lie-Robbins would take a square root here. There's no square root, okay? But for anything, you can calculate it. It just spits out and you get an answer, okay? So you need, you need exponential distribution. So that includes uh, Gaussian and Bernoulli and... I'm sorry? Alpha of t is my bias rate. So go back to uh, the whole exponential uh, cost bias. Let's go back. Okay, you remember this, this formula? I said, uh, or actually they go back even earlier. Okay, I said this is a likelihood function, right? And I said I'm going to favor parameters which have larger optimal rewards. And I'm going to exponentiate them with some alpha of t, which is going to infinity but little of t. So that's alpha, okay? All right, now, so this, that same alpha shows up here. I'm almost done. Yeah. Two minutes, yeah. Okay, so, so, so for the exponential family, right? So, so that's what I'm doing here. This is the likelihood function. This is the reward, the mean of an arm, right? The mean of an arm in the exponential family is the derivative of this term, okay? These are some standard stuff. 
but I can choose any monotone function, but an exponentiated with alpha, okay? And for any uh, thing in this family, this is the explicit solution of the index, okay? And these are the formulas. So, so here, Ti is the number of times I've played Amai. But capital T is the current time. So the current time is the total of the times I've played each of the other arms. So if there are five arms, T1 is how much time I've played this, T2, T3, T4, T5. The total of that is the current time capital T. So the index is the, this, this, this is the reward over Ti trials divided by Ti. So this is the mean reward. And this is alpha T over Ti. D different from the Lie and Robbins because they, they do square root of log t over whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, a simple formula, so okay. All right, so here are the theorems, okay. Expected bound and regret. So supposing you know the lower bound and the difference between the best arm and the second best arm, and then if you choose alpha t equal to c log t, you choose that bias rate, then in fact the regret is big O of log t, so it's order optimal. Uh, same as all the, I mean, just order optimal. On the other hand, if you don't know this difference, the uh, best and second best are very close, then you actually have to choose a diverging uh, thing here. Okay, I'd like to remove this, but I don't know how to do it. Okay, uh, sample path bound. Now, the sample path bound you can actually get for anything, but, uh, uh, but this uh, actually worked it out. So, this is a high probability sample path bound, which says with, prob with confidence greater than one minus delta, I can ensure that the number of wrong plays in the interval zero to t stays below c alpha t plus constant, okay, for every c greater than one. So given your confidence parameter c greater than one, there is a constant case such that this is true. So it's kind of a high confidence sample path bound also you can get. What about empirical testing, okay? So we did thorough testing uh, with uh, lots of uh, things. So Bernoulli bandits, I, no, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that uh, these are the expected and sample path bounds and regret for, for all these. Yeah, I think, you know, you can actually get this thing as low as you like with the high probability, except the constant K will keep increasing, okay? No, no, actually, so this, uh, no, you can prove this. You don't even need UCB. You can actually, let's do the following. Supposing at times uh, 10, 100, million, trillion, you know, some exponentially or doubly exponentially growing things, I, at those times, I do round robin selection. Then I'm guaranteed that I'll choose every arm infinitely often. So with the strong law of large numbers, things will converge. And then in between, if I choose the largest one, then it'll converge. So the only mistakes I made asymptotically are across this rare sequence. So that can be made as sparse as you like. So that kind of result you can get. But then this constant T will increase. <laughs> because if the more rare you make it, the number of times you have to try it to discover the right thing is long. So, so this can be obtained for anything. I just worked it out for this. Okay. Not a big deal. I think this is the bigger deal. Okay. Empirical testing for Bernoulli bandits. So this is uh, illustratory. So let's take arms which are pretty hard to distinguish, you know, 0.455 versus 0.4. I think this should be, whatever, point, I probably forgot 0.4, yeah, 0.4665, kind of minutely different, okay? 0 0.005 and uh, averaged over trials. So here, it turns out that we investigated different bias rates, okay? Log squared t, log to the 1.5 and so on. It turns out that for all Bernoulli bandits, the best choice is log to the 1.5. It's kind of stable, okay? All right, now what we've done is we've compared with the tuned versions of the best. So as I said, Thompson's sampling was the original Thompson sampling. Over time, that has been uh, uh, tuned. I don't know which one of these. This is UT UCB has been tuned. Uh, information directed search that also has been improved, etc. But basically, this bias maximum likelihood is the best, okay, for for the Bernoulli case. And if you want the statistics, this is the mean regret compared to all the others. And if you do Gaussian, 
again with some arms. Uh, it, it turns out for the Gaussian family, you, log squared t okay, is better. And uh, again, it beats all the other things, including knowledge gradient, uh, Bayes used to be there, are many variations, but these are all the current best contenders. And uh, the mean regret is like that. It's also true for exponential distributions and other things which we haven't, I'm not showing you about. But this is important, computation time, okay? So we're not, yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, ultimately, yeah, there's no substitute for actual testing on the ground, especially when you have small samples, small number of trials, like 10,000. So yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're definitely not, uh, yeah. Have you stored some lower bounds in this? Not lower, upper. Of, uh, lower bound for this particular policy? Was no. no. I, I cannot make this theoretical bounds equal the. Yeah. In theory, in theory, it's a constant. Yes. I, no, we tried KLUCB also. I think uh, I, oh, I have. Uh, we have done KLUCB somewhere. I don't know. We have. We have done it. I don't know. KL. It is there. Okay. They've done. They've done all the. Yeah. Students have very diligently tested everything. But what I want to point out here is I'm drawing a two-dimensional performance. I'm telling you the regret, but also the computation time, okay? Computation time is important because when we solve Google scale problems, there are zillions of advertisers, arms, and so on. Computation is important. So this is a bias maximum likelihood. It gives you the best regret. And even things which are kind of close to that in regret, our computation time is two orders of magnitude. Worse, and in fact, it gets worse when you put more arms because it is a very difficult thing to calculate. This is a, this information-directed search, which is very computation-heavy. Uh, for the Gaussian case, again, you know, you get a order difference and so on. So that's basically what I want to tell you. So regret is important. Okay, it means money or people. And uh, I think computation scaling is also important. And this method seems to be currently the best, but it has, a, the point is that this extends in a straightforward way because it's a general thing for Markov decision process. It applies to, you can do contextual bandits, Bayesian optimization, model-based reinforcement learning, efficient exploration and model free. My students put this in, I'm not quite sure what exactly they want to do, but they want to do something here. But we haven't worked all this out, but it suggests uh, strategies for all these problems. And that's all I stop. Uh, there is a archive version somewhere, and that's it. Thank you.